Um, are you recording? Okay, so off we go. Um, so uh, tonight we have a very special guest with us, uh, that is Mo2. And um, yeah, how do I introduce Mo2? Um, no, no superlatives. No what? Superlatives, hyperbole. Okay, now I'm going to go on hyperbole, I'm sorry. So, um, no, this is a special one to me because um, Mo2 is an artist, um, now based in Berlin. He is also uh, more than a graffiti pioneer, actually graffiti royalty, you could say. And actually, in, <laughs> in uh, one of the links you sent me an interview, he was, he was um, you got the name of Hip Hop Authority. So let's, let's stick with that. But this is special. This is very special because uh, I have to say that since my youth, I've been myself very uh, influenced or strongly influenced by hip hop culture. And it's, let's say, a very open celebration of cutting up, of mixing, of scratching, of sampling appropriated uh, content to create like new storylines, basically. Out of the reconfigured and recontextualized existing material. And um, growing up in this culture um, and also uh, getting involved uh, with the graffiti culture, there was a book, Breaking Art, that was kind of the Bible to me, actually to all of my friends. If you think of me, imagine Lucas at the age of 12 or 13, and this book was literally the Bible. And since I wasn't so much into lettering, but more into cartoons, and my goal was always to be a cartoon artist, basically, my entire childhood. I was very drawn to the work of Mo too. I literally kind of redrew probably all of his drawings in this book. So I'm, yes, I have to admit it. Um, so having you here is um, being a bit excited, like a teenage excitement that I have here, and a great appreciation uh, of you coming here to university to kind of share your work, and you will also take us through a whole kind of historic journey in many ways. Roller coaster. A, a, a historic roller coaster. Mm -hmm. So that said, please give a very warm applause to our guest Mo Tu. Um, before we start, I try to edit this down, uh, but like uh, we have 45 minutes, and I've got. A, approximately 173 visuals. So uh, yeah, work that one out. Um, so um, I'm just gonna swipe these images and, uh, uh, and explain as I go along. And I'm gonna try to be concise, and here we go. Right, so uh, that's my tag, right two. This is the event, I scribbled that last night, scanned it in, blah, 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 blah. And uh, that's, that's it with the event. Um, so where shall I begin? Um, my passport says that I'm born in Quatrebon, that's a town in Mauritius, in 1967, about two months after Che Guevara got murdered in Bolivia, I think. Yeah. Anyway, so that's uh, Quatrebon, uh, that little thing there on the island of Mauritius. Mauritius is famous for the dodo, uh, well, the dead as a dodo, and, um, and is a platform for everybody else's business. Another one of these countries that mistook independence for autonomy. Um, if you go further, it's there in the Indian Ocean. And uh, my mother's brother fought in Suez in 1956 for the Commonwealth forces. And when he saw that the British and the French got their asses kicked, um, he said, as soon as you can get out, get out. So uh, my parents went to London at different, stages, at different stages. Mauritius, for a lot of people, is a really nice holiday destination. It's like a bit of a paradise, blah, 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 blah. So it's got all these idyllic beaches and na, 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 na all this kind of stuff, like luxury resorts. Um, but for the people who are actually born there, the youth, uh, and the mix, the cultural mix is really rich from very many different backgrounds, from different stages in, the, in a colonial time, from the Dutch to the French to the British, and then post-colonial. Um, well, it's neo-colonialism anyway. Uh, that's another th story. Um, so, but if you're not connected, if you don't have any um, family connections, uh, Beamter, all this kind of stuff, you're going to be um, somewhere stuck. And uh, for a lot of the youth, it's really bad. And it's got one of the highest rates of, uh, of uh, drug use in the Indian Ocean, mostly chemicals, which uh, children make in the school lab, apparently, uh, because uh, growing weed uh, is a capital offense, which you can get hung for. Anyway, so going nowhere, but this is how 
my childhood with my brothers and my sister, we, were, we just spent by the beach and I, during holiday times and in the other rest of the time in the town, going to school, blah, 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 learning a bit of English, French, and other children were doing a Hindi or Urdu or Tamil, like because uh, it was, it's a completely mixed place. So I got lucky that I left, my father left in 1973, my, I think it was August, my mother, February 75, and us as a children, we left in um, July 76. Um, so yeah, between the tourist point of view and what it means to grow up there, uh, it's completely two, two different extremes. So on the passport, there's 12th of July 76, and that's when uh, we uh, land in, uh, at Heathrow Airport, and uh, we are completely overwhelmed by this massive city and uh, coming from a small island with, uh, where my grandmother's house still had no electricity and uh, still had an outside toilet, uh, but, and, like, and so on and so forth. So uh, pretty radical culture shock. Um, this is a center point, um, that's Oxford Street. Uh, it's all changed a lot, not just the fashion since then, a lot of, uh, then, okay, privatization, Maggie Thatcher, and now we're going, let's, Piccadilly Circus, I try not to go into politics, uh, but, but, uh, so but that was the, when Lily Weiss was still Lily Weiss and not owned by a foreign company, like most of the stuff in the UK. Anyway, um, so nobody in Mauritius uh, or the British, the way they handled their colonies, um, they never told you what happened outside. And the British, as an insular nation, are probably the most irresponsible decolonizers, leaving uh, uh, geopolitical messes behind them. But anyway, um, I'll digress. No one told me there were black people living. No one told us that Jamaicans were black. Uh, you're just assuming that you're going to go somewhere with just white people around you. So you arrive in Lewisham, southeast London, and it's just full of Jamaicans. And uh, you are walking down the street, and you're hearing the <laughs> and you and closer and closer comes, and you can feel that the bass, because people have speakers in their, in their car, I mean, big speakers. So the first booming systems were not from LL Cool J and all this kind of stuff. Jamaicans did that before everybody else. Uh, so uh, DJ sound systems, they did it before everybody else. Uh, Saxon was the local crew, and two other guys from my school, one of my friends from school became, what's it, um, there's Tipper Sandy and Junior Sandy, that's Dawson Sandiford, was one of the DJs. But DJs in Jamaican, they rap on the mic, or they toast. But J Dawson Sandiford was part of Saxon, and uh, this is the kind of vibe that they were about. And um, we lived in uh, George Lane, South East London in Lewisham, and the streets are parallel. So the gardens, the back gardens, give one onto the other. And maybe once every couple of months, the neighbours in the next street would have what we call a blues party. And uh, so a truck would come, uh, furniture would be moved upstairs, they take the speakers off, and over the whole weekend, like your windows of your bedroom are vibrating from the bass. And, uh, but it was normal then, you know, there was no stress about it, like it was just a normal cultural South London life. Uh, so that's uh, them again, and uh, that's still them again. Um, but then, at the very same time, we're talking July 1976, something interesting was happening uh, out in the suburbs, uh, Bromley's nice, leafy and stuff, and it was more like this kind of stuff. So uh, here I am coming from a small island and uh, having the Jamaicans on one side and then hearing this completely mad sound, which was punk, which was kicking off that very summer, uh, the British uh, kind of version of punk. So. Uh, um, this was the kind of stuff that uh, we were exposed to. This is before the No Future, all that kind of stuff, but like uh, Sex Pistols, all that stuff was very much uh, on the air and in your face when they were not getting banned for saying rude things on, uh, on uh, what's that, TV programs and stuff like that, like Pebble Mill, I think, uh, they got banned from that. Um, so I was caught between musical extremes and um, I'm always kind of attracted by what's the polar opposite from me and all the, um, terrain there is between me and who's opposite from me. Uh, and uh, there's so much to be learned and so much to be shared between people coming from different places, no matter what the politicians might say or what the divide and rule of colonialism might say. But anyway, that's a no, no, no. Um, so, but this is the kind of stuff that we were getting. We are 1976, so that's like 
two, three years after the oil crisis and um, uh, unemployment and stuff like that. And uh, for some people, the National Front, they were, they've, they were on about, uh, yeah, it's the foreigners' fault, blah, 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 and especially the blacks. So this was a march that they did through, that they tried to do from New Cross to Lucian on the 13th of August, 1977, uh, and it was called the Battle of Lucian. So down the road from me, uh, we had the people from the neighborhood, like we didn't want to hear about this march, and uh, so they were all there ready to block the National Front who, mar who wanted to march through. And uh, then uh, the police were, as you can see, protecting the National Front, and then uh, so the scuffle started to break out, and uh, it really started to go off. Uh, this is Dark as Hell, who's quite famous in the U UK, so like uh, there were lots of uh, organising within the communities and speeches and all that kind of stuff going on as well as a counter protest. And uh, like, uh, yeah, what's it? what did Trump said? Uh, there were good people on both sides about Charlottesville, but that's another story. Um, so this was the kind of stuff that was going off in, um, in uh, Lucian on the 13th of August, 1977. And uh, yeah, mounted police, all that kind of stuff. So, for a nine-year-old like myself, uh, yeah, okay, this was hot. Uh, but like, uh, we also had other interests because we were children. You know, that's why you probably see also children playing in refugee camps. But that's another story. Um, it was comics, and uh, weekly, you like comics. Weekly, uh, 2000 AD and Star Lord came out. I mean, so how much work the artist who drew for those comics put in? Which, which you've got like four or five pages of blocks of uh, images that must tell a story, that must have rhythm, flow, uh, harmony, you know. And, um, for, the, for those amongst you who know Gorillaz and Jamie Hewlett, you'll probably get an understanding of, a, of a, what level of skill it actually takes to be a comic artist, but it's looked down on, it's not seen as art, it's probably, I don't know how it's considered. I never went to art school, so I don't really care anyway. And, uh, and um, we, are, we come from a culture where we try to reinvent everything anyway and don't care. So this was the kind of stuff that I was into. Um, and um, Judge Dredd, anyone heard of Judge Dredd? No? Uh, Mike McMahon on the, was one of my favorite artists of, uh, of uh, back then. And uh, the good thing about 2000 AD was that it also tapped into what was going on at the time. And, um, and uh, if there was a song that, that was big in the charts, like uh, Madness with One Step Beyond or whatever, they would use what's going on uh, either in politics or current affairs and somehow integrate that into the comics. Like, I like this one with the Un-American Graffiti and uh, ABC Warriors was a little bit further on, a bit, little bit further on. Anyway, um, all you want to do was go hang with your friends at school, get into comics, go play football in the park, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's my primary school, uh, Hither Green Primary School, full of Welsh teachers, I don't know how, but like Mrs. Short was the best music teacher you could ever wish for. And uh, when we did uh, Wizard of Oz, between seven schools, we got the five top roles, and I played the lion, and I sang in front of 1,500 people at Lucian Town Hall. But anyway, uh, we really had really good music teachers. Uh, it was a really, really uh, enriching place, and it was completely at random that my parents got us, my brother and myself, like, into this school. And then, 1977 still, uh, for those who were not born then and didn't feel that the shock, this happened. So, um, for many of you, this is, yeah, this is like, uh, yeah, uh, we've heard about this Krieg der Stern, blah, 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 blah. But uh, back then, um, this was complete landmark milestone. Nothing like this had ever happened in uh, science fiction movies. Um, this is a nice poster because this is by the brothers Hildebrand, twin brothers who uh, did a lot of uh, illustrations and stuff with acrylic. Um, and for those who know my work, the blue and the orange uh, as um, cold and hot, these are the kind of things that influence me. Uh, so another poster there. Opening scene, um, the music, John Williams fades away, and a da -da -da -dum, da -da -dum, drum roll, and we come down to the planet Tatooine. We're there, my brother and I, sitting in the Odeon uh, cinema in Lucium on purple velvet seats. And uh, so we see that first ship then come through. We say, wow, I've never seen that before. And then a few like laser uh, balls come out. Wow, what, what the hell is this? And then comes this triangular shaped imperial cruiser. Like we'd never thought that um, 
uh, spaceships could be that kind of shape. But this is where everything kind of gets turned onto its head. And um, you're in the park playing football and you're imagining that behind this cloud there, there's a spaceship like this, like hidden camouflage behind all that kind of stuff. But it's stuff that really did stimulate your um, imagination as a child and uh, you're seeing stuff everywhere, you know, like so. Um, anyway, so um, at the same time, a couple of years later, before Peter Jackson got into uh, Tolkien, was Ralph Bakshi made a version of Lord of the Rings uh, using cartoons and, uh, and a real um, film mixed with uh, cartoons. And uh, he only got as far as the Battle of Helm's Deep, didn't get much further than that. Uh, maybe they ran out of money, but uh, that was for us like the step into, we had Star Wars for the science fiction and then Lord of the Rings for um, fantasy. And uh, for those who know Tolkien, he's like a, well, like the Don that just laid the thing down for everyone and just about anything you read in from JK Rowling to anyone is, sounds like Tolkien rehashed. Anyway, that's my opinion. Uh, you saw that as a child, you told me, like when you were 12 and you got really scared. But um, yeah, this was a really, you can see like the, the, you know, the tree roots, all this kind of stuff. This is all, uh, when you've had very bland uh, TV, this, that, and the other, but like here you're getting a massive amount of uh, visual input and uh, our brains then were not saturated as they are with the amount of information we get today. So you're just, it's all landing and sticking, 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 and you're uh, having your own building blocks for your, how you're going to make your own interpretation of what's going to come next. So uh, science fiction and fantasy, um, this was when I was in secondary school. I started secondary school in 1979 when Margaret Thatcher came to power. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, anyone remember Alien, the first Alien, uh, I think it's a, um, Horror movie in space, um, I haven't, uh, very hard to do better than that. And also Ridley Scott, Blade Runner, near future, uh, wow, it was set in 2019, I think. Uh, yeah, we've been there, done that, but like, uh, we, we're not to this thing yet. Uh, so, uh, but we got mobile phones and all this kind of, and smartphones and this and the other, but like, uh, th this was really, really uh, grand stuff for, for, for back then. Back to reality. Um, Secondary school, um, I was a kind of a model student, so uh, I could get away with shit like having a badge on my school uniform because it was a badge of Charlie Chaplin. And most of the other children, they wanted to wear badges with punk and this, that, and the other, but Charlie Chaplin, uh, I managed to slide through. And um, our school, the prison on the hill, became a girls' school after the Prendergast Girls' School burnt down. But like back then, it was uh, our school on top of a hill, Hilly Fields in Broccoli, uh, nicknamed the prison on the hill and any student from any other, other secondary school that needed to cross it to go home they had to turn their jackets inside out LA gang style but way before we had heard anything about, about LA so right uh, outside of school hours um, role-playing games I heard that uh, I haven't I don't I don't do Netflix I don't do any of that stuff but I heard that Stranger Things uh, gave a reboost to a Kate Bush's music career, and also gave a reboot to uh, Dungeons and Dragons, so uh, yeah, whatever. But uh, Traveller was the science fiction version um, of role playing, and we used to have uh, little figurines about 12 and a half millimeters high that we'd paint, but I don't have photos of any of them. Uh, we used to have a few of them, lead figurines. Yeah, we played with lead, we painted lead figurines and all that kind of stuff back then. Um, and we, uh, we invent our own scenarios, um, so imagination is just like boiling over. And uh, at the other end is Dungeons and Dragons, which is what um, Stranger Things is supposed to be about. But like, uh, so um, uh, we put an ad in a monthly magazine called The White Dwarf uh, about any gamers in our area. And uh, so you'd get people that would come round to your house because yeah, you could, you could leave your home address in a, in a magazine back, back then, it's like nuts. Uh, and um, and um, so either myself or Mick Sullivan, who was a friend of my eldest brother, would be dungeon master for one weekend. So you must invent the scenario, you must invent the whole uh, landscape, the dungeon, everything uh, down on mi on millimeter paper, because you're going because uh, and then you have your dungeon master screen, and they on the other side, you have to describe everything to them. So you have four or five people facing you who. Are building up and interpreting and making up their own images of what you're saying with words. So incredible amount of storytelling, uh, no, uh, what's it, um, 
computer generated imagery or anything it's just pure just using your natural sensors to do stuff and then to have to map out on their millimeter paper uh, what's going on um, and so I used to paint lead figurines so you can see that's the size of my thumb here uh, Ralph Partha was a really good brand I think one of the best from the early 80s with a guy called Tornado Tom Mayer who could write uh, uh, he would uh, sculpt them in epoxy and from this they would be cast in a, in a lead so um, this is one of mine my brother would do the chain mail like he would dilute uh, black enamel with the uh, with a uh, white spirit and uh, drop it into the chain mail and then we pass a very light cloth over it so that then it shines, it accentuates the, the depth of, like, like of, the, of the male. You can see like this kind of necromancer wizard thing here. So yeah, we were painting like, with uh, enamel paints like, uh, and, and, and brushes, the tiny things. And these two here are actually from a guy called Bill Brewer, who was um, the owner of the Rice Stamp and Hobby Shop in Peckham. And uh, my brother and I, when we take the 36 bus up from Lucian, get down to the bottom of the street, we'd start walking and at the end we were running just to get to the shop because the Rice Stamp and Hobby Shop was, uh, was the place and I got my first job there painting lead figurines. So uh, I was like 13 or something. And my brother and I, we won in 1982 at Salute, which is a national gamers meeting uh, at Westminster City Hall. We got in third place in 1982 and in 1983, because you just bring your lead figurine that you've painted or a little diorama, you know, you'd go and look for moss in the garden and you'd put moss on it and you'd be spraying it and stuff to keep it moist, to keep it uh, green and alive instead of the other people using synthetic stuff that they use on railway sets. Uh, you would be crushing bricks so that we can have like a, a gradation of, a, of a different size stones, you know, and dropping again like a diluted um, uh, enamel paint to, to give it depth, uh, you know, like a more enhanced. And uh, there was a, if you look on Lewis Carroll, there's a, there's a poem called Jabberwocky, and uh, Tornado Tom Mayer painted a Jabberwock, uh, no, he sculpted like a Jabberwock, and I painted it, my brother did the base with the moss and everything, and we got first prize in uh, 1983. And, uh, not a lot of black people in uh, that kind of world and like uh, the faces in the hall because you just leave your stuff on the table, the judges judge and then they call you up and uh, so uh, my brother always hangs in the back and I went to, to pick up the prize and uh, yeah, they were a bit um, surprised. Uh, anyway, so um, there were also back then the comics for grown-ups. Uh, heavy Metal was the American version of Metal Yolant which was a... Uh, uh, from the late 60s or early 70s in France. So uh, uh, Patrick Druyer, Moebius, um, like uh, Casa, these are like really famous French comic artists like of, the, of those times. And uh, that's Druyer here. I can't remember who this guy is. Uh, could be either Boris Vallejo, but I don't think it's Frazetta. And that's uh, Moebius uh, over there. And um, I've got number one till when it went quarterly apart from free issues, and they're all uh, in boxes in, the, in the plastic bags. Totally nerdy, but hey, you kind of keep that kind of stuff. Um, what's it? They say in this world that everything will be di di digitalized, but no, they're going to select what will be digitalized from print, and the rest is going to be destroyed uh, bit by bit or forgotten about, and that's our reference points, our history, our identity that's disappearing day by day. Epic Comics was another version. Uh, uh, that came out at around the same time. For those who know Bill Shankovich, Electro Assassin and stuff, eh, I don't know. Anyway, that's Bill Shankovich. Simon Bisley, who did Slain and stuff like that, and classic uh, Frank Frazetta also. So this was like, a, I've got a few of those as well. Um, anyway, um, around that time, there was a bubbling and stuff going on. Uh, we could hear some sounds, hear some things here and there, and then um, uh, this happened. Like uh, Malcolm McLaren, Buffalo Girls, um, what's that, um, I think it was 82, and uh, suddenly uh, the world again, uh, same as with Star Wars, I guess, it flipped onto its head, and there was a completely new sound, com and suddenly like gaming and all that kind of stuff seemed a little bit uh, stay at home and boring. Uh, so uh, I first saw uh, someone painting graffiti on um, the video for Buffalo Girls, and that's Dondi. Uh, outlining. So to see someone's hand that is not touching the, the surface 
and uh, that it's coming in like magic, he's outlining the thing. It's like as a child you say, I want to do this, you know, so, um, so that's that. So Buffalo Girls, a video. Um, then uh, Hey You, the Rocksteady crew, uh, and uh, Up Rock from the Rocksteady crew. Those green did the bo both of the sleeves, but like the difference between here and here is that these are almost life-size uh, pe uh, pencil and marker pen drawings. And so these ones you can relate to because it's not spray cam, which is an alien tool for you. But here you suddenly have a whole bunch of b-boy characters, the whole attitude, the whole everything, got the lettering, got everything, all packaged in one. And that was sent to every corner of the world where this record was sold. So um, uh, that's a massive uh, influence also for um, anyone into this scene. That's the wall from Wild Star, which was also done in 1982, which ZDF financed. Actually, um, actually, because uh, Americans don't seem to realize the value of their counterculture, but that's another story. Um, and uh, so um, we just got uh, bombarded with all of that as it uh, exploded from New York. And uh, so, yeah, it, this uh, alchemy, this equation, it uh, outgrew New York, and um, it was brought by Europeans who were in New York, and uh, it took root in London too, and that was uh, Covent Garden for us, which was a central area. Uh, that used to be a flower market, turned into a pedestrian area. And uh, this is where, for everyone, it was halfway to cross the city. They, they, they were not going from one neighborhood and having to cross the whole city. Everyone converged around there, and that became a really, really rich um, uh, point for uh, um, anyone into dancing, into the music, into rapping, into graffiti, into anything. Like, uh, that was around there. I took photos back then uh, because uh, I realized that uh, what we were living was completely different. So it, in 1985, I saw Patrick Litchfield with an advert for the Canon Shaw shot. So I bought myself a Canon Shaw shot, uh, and, uh, and I was taking photos of uh, the people around me uh, because uh, we were living something that has, I thought had never been lived by others before. And I think I'm right. Um, so uh, these are the friends and, uh, that I used to uh, hang out with uh, that would dance. Uh, was it dance together, get a beatbox, go to Trafalgar Square, go to Leicester Square, dance in front of the tourists, and there'll be more money coming into the hat than they ever would have got as pocket money as anything like that. Uh, that's Mark Feathers. Uh, uh, there were also girls there. Sigi, I saw her just a couple of weeks ago, actually, since first time in decades, because uh, there was the um, Beyond the Streets show at the Saatchi Gallery that just finished on the 9th, uh, Tuesday last week. Uh, Billy uh, Business, Jesus Christ, the time's going fast. All right, let's go, let's go. Um, my crew, uh, that was me with my jacket back then. And uh, yeah, didn't matter, you can be as figuratively, da, 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 you want to do comics like uh, Lucas or stuff, but like, uh, it's the letters that was going to make the difference. And my first piece was super wax, uh, like, uh, just like, uh, tried to do everything, throw in all the arrows, everything you thought that the New Yorkers did. And there was a girl from New York who was like, your piece is whack. And I thought, okay. <laughs> Uh, so from that point, I thought maybe we need to, that, to somehow get into our own stuff and not uh, try to mimic the New Yorkers because we, we, we weren't living in New York. We were living in southeast London and I'm from this small island in the Indian Ocean. This is a gathering in uh, Birmingham uh, in June or early July uh, 1985. Uh, that's Pride and myself on the left. That's, um, what should we call it, uh, 3D from Massive Attack actually and his mate. Uh, then Brim and Bio from New York, and uh, Goldie, uh, because 3D from Massive Attack was also doing a lot of graffiti back then. Uh, Goldie on the uh, here, mate of his, Scribbler the guy who I started out with, mate of Goldie's, Zaki D, myself, and Pride, 1985. That's my bedroom wall uh, from back then, so a whole mixture of like uh, uh, pictures from blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, uh, what's it, these guys here, that's in Copenhagen, 86, uh, just whatever. Yeah, um, that's what kind of stuff you do. Um, photos taken by Henry Chalfont, uh, Saturday 19th of May 1985 in, in uh, um, Notting Hill. Um, so yeah, so we began traveling uh, uh, because uh, you outgrow your space and you're looking for competition. So off we went to Paris. Uh, I started to travel alone when I was 17. Uh, this is um, 14th of July 1985. Uh, and uh, th this we did as a group, uh, group action on the riverbanks. And just above here is the Musée d'Orsay, which was still at an abandoned station. 
back then, which was la, the Garde d'Orsay. So that's where you go to see uh, uh, Monet and, and stuff in his... Uh, uh, anyway, so uh, you used to hang in clubs and stuff like that for anyone who knows uh, second from right, that's sort of Vincent Cassel, uh, when he was also uh, um, into all this kind of stuff and doing graf graffiti and competing with who has the most Puma Clyde sneakers with fat laces in. Um, that's another war we, we did, like illegal war over five nights, the 5th to the 9th of August 1987. Uh, and uh, then Spray Can Art came out, that book that, um, yeah, that Lucas was going on about. And um, people who you thought were your friends, they change from one week to the next. You're, you're the same guy as last week because you know that this book is coming out because you've argued with Henry Chalfont and Jim Prigoff that you don't want to be on the cover, but it came out like that. And, uh, and people are still saying, oh, don't worry, you're going to get good promo from this job, but I can't pay you. It's like, man, I had the promo in 87. It's like, I, I just want to get paid for a job. Uh, anyway, um, 1990, uh, CBS Records, uh, what's that? My bag got stolen. That's, my, that's one of my black books there, the red one, uh, being held by Joey from NTM. And um, it was a bit of a messy night because some of us were doing mushrooms and stuff, and we uh, had about, uh, we, uh, we got angry and we destroyed a lot of stuff. Anyway, um, June uh, 1990, uh, Jean-Baptiste Mondino, Franck Chevalier, again, uh, who was a boyfriend of Nina Hagen back then. They have a son called Otis, uh, who uh, is back in Berlin, I think. And uh, so um, uh, we did a photo shoot for this club that we used to be around back then. So everything was always crisscrossing. Uh, Franck was the PA of, uh, or the press guy for uh, Jean-Paul Gaultier, so that opened so many avenues to uh, and so many contacts and stuff. Um, much further down the line, uh, this is a Daft Punk cover. Uh, what's that? Picture this, I did Daft, Daft Punk Slum Village, uh, 1,001 copies. Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we just dabble and dabble and dabble. Oh, yeah, back to letters, tags, uh, throw-ups. Uh, First outlines before you do, um, that was 1994, Custard Factory, Birmingham, and it was a, uh, 10 years after I started to, to, to paint. So um, I've got this girl with a lion thing, uh, Kate Bush, uh, England, my lion heart, anyway, a Kate Bush reference. Uh, Wiesbaden, 1997, completely improvised, all of it, uh, like uh, mechanized letters and stuff, uh, the kind of stuff that Dime was trying to bite from uh, Delta, but like really horribly going wrong. But no, uh, what's that? You just get familiarized with shapes and dimensions and stuff, and you can build letters with anything. So th that was that. Um, spray paint. Um, we used to steal the stuff. It used to be really hard to come by, and now it's a massive industry, and all I see are just like loads of empty cans being thrown around everywhere, and it's really disgusting. But the people who make that, just think that we're a bunch of vandals and we're probably substance abusers and they put no effort into making into the recycling of cans or there's nothing like that put into place and it's one of the most polluting um, activities because there's nothing put into place. If uh, there was some kind of return on cans, uh, some kind of fund, we wouldn't be having this problem. But uh, it's not an area of um, the economy where they care about who's using them. Uh, more letters. Uh, lifted London, uh, no, Paris, Dunois, 2003. Uh, Cape Town, 2006. That actually says media, M E D I A, and I'm trying to use a whole bunch of different, uh, and that's all improvised shit also, uh, but like just grabbing stuff that we know from our head. And um, this was uh, uh, Athens, uh, 2011, uh, maybe early November. And uh, the very first outlines, uh, I told them to put um, a blindfold on, on me, and I just did, I paced the wall, then I did the first outline blind, just to get a feel of how we are with letters. Um, one, one liner for a show in 2014 in Amsterdam, whatever. Uh, one liner, Strasbourg, 2010. So the one liner, it's just like a, with one line you go, and you make the whole word with one line, and the arrow kind of pop out here. But that's all that one line. It's like uh, music has a beginning and an end. Dancing is also a movement, and we can also draw or do stuff with just one line. It's just one continuous thing. Uh, that's also one line that actually starts 
up there, go through this figure, through the figures over there, through these uh, letters, and uh, so that's also just one line. But it's just a, a finer principle, apply it, and just take it as far as you can. Um, yeah, anyway, pencil to paper. Uh, we always carry around sketch for 12 minutes. Ah, this is so bad. Like, uh, so um, anywhere where you're around, it's like I've got a, what's it, a, a, a book in the bag. I've got a, a pens also in a, in a bag. It's always useful to have because the idea that you have, the quickest way is down your arm and onto a piece of paper. Uh, it's been happening for tens of thousands of years, even hundreds of thousands of years, but like whatever. Uh, so I always have uh, sketchbooks around and just sketching stuff. Uh, old sketch, 1985. Um, so yeah, and also you can even put uh, what do you call it? A spray paint inside your book if you want to get really elaborate. So you get landscape shaped books or or portrait shaped books. Uh, uh, what's that? Anything you see, you try to watch people and you try to remember the movement. This was a girl going down the escalator in Paris, uh, wearing a turquoise uh, thing, uh, leggings there. And uh, I'm thinking, okay, I got to draw this. I got to draw this. And then when you get a chance to sit down, then you try to do it from memory, uh, and also from memory. But that's another story. Um, 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 a life without music and dance. Hell no. So uh, yeah, Battle of the Year posters, I did those for ages and ages and ages. Uh, I don't even do any like breaking my, myself, but you have to try to convey uh, the idea of what's going on like in the party because you're there in the thick of it. And uh, this is an uh, instantaneous uh, art form where every movement that you do is done and over as you're doing it. So uh, um, uh, that's uh, Hermann Platz that I used as a, as a reference. And the dancers were from a show that Storm was uh, 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 doing the choreography for at Hal Eins. And I asked the guys to uh, just try to kind of battle and stuff, na -na -na -na, on the backyard. And I used uh, just the positioning as a reference. Uh, Braunschweig, I think it was, uh, like, a, like again. And um, so yeah, uh, posters for the battle of the year in uh, um, France. Anyway. People you meet along the way. Uh, Swifty Studio, uh, first in uh, Thursday, 13th of uh, December, 1997. Uh, no, 12th of December, sorry. Um, and uh, hung out with him. He did the, all the stuff for More Wax at the beginning. Um, and um, also, he used to be uh, uh, the graphic editor of The Face magazine and stuff like that. Um, October 97 on... Um, um, Hoxton Square, when it was still a nice place in Shoreditch, uh, doing a live painting. So this live thing there becomes this finished painting there. Uh, and then all the flyers for um, Bar Rumba Monday nights, which, uh, and then this influenced this one, which got used as a house bag by Ross Allen when he was working at Blue, the record label. So there's a lot of stuff that came out with this. And there's something that came out recently uh, with an old Jay Diller mix for that. Um, Rude Movements, that's a, a party that my friend uh, Tyler used to organize at apartment in New York, and that's the flyers that come from the thing. So it's all about uh, people being on the dance floor and uh, respecting each other's space. If you tread on someone's foot, you turn around and, and apologize. You don't spill your drink on a dance floor because that kind of just destroys dancing space. Uh, you know, If the world could be as nice as uh, some of the dance floors that I know, uh, you know, maybe would be a lot better off. Uh, Giorgio Dimitri, Lawrence Passera, photographer, myself, and Futura. This was in Milano, I think, in 2004. Uh, with Futura and Delta, we did a club called More. Um, in, uh, so we're just collaborating, just work, working together. It was also made into a website that's not up anymore because it's HTML. Uh, product made from it, uh, DVD and everything. And uh, then we did something at the Bethanian, Adrian, like 2005 with Delta, and Futura came along, but I don't have those photos on here. Um, then we did something again in 2015 at the Bethanian, and uh, this is uh, all improvised stuff, like and Delta just used. Uh, so these are pe people that you meet and that you've known for years and that you just get with, and uh, just like improvising music, you improvise visual stuff. Um, we did something again in 2019 in France, in Bourgogne at La Carrière, which is a place I'm kind of working with uh, to get the, these uh, big murals painted in 2019. Uh, Goldie for the signing of his book, because I did the release for Saturn's Return, which was uh, early 98, I think, his second album. Um, 
Harry Pacinotti, born in 1935, did Nova magazine, and um, the first magazine to have a black model on the cover. This is all like late 60s stuff. Uh, he did a few Pirelli calendars. Uh, he was a really, really good, um, um, what's that, creative director as well. Like Harry Pac Pacinotti, like uh, just uh, for your information. Uh, and this is a calendar that I did for Damiani with him. Like he was doing the photos while I was doing the drawings. Uh, live performance, yeah. Uh, 2006 Lovebox Festival, our friend the DJ here had died of leukemia a couple of days before, so I did this uh, another kind of dance scene, but just with a few colors, you know, so you can see just the uh, yellow, the orange, the purple, and, uh, and you just biff bash bosh, and you just like, uh, uh, just have fun, yeah, just let off, yeah. Um, another one, uh, Loud Graphics, uh, 2007, month of May, uh, in, on uh, Falkensteinstrasse there upstairs. Um, um, uh, Latitude Festival in the UK, also just live stuff sometimes. Uh, again, live stuff. I did a Bacchanal um, uh, scene there, like, uh, 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 yeah, there was, a, I, I forgot to take the thing off from the other. Okay, and this is uh, Art in the Street, uh, May, April 2011 at the Mocha in LA, which was a really big show, seven minutes. Uh, uh, so this is a mural that I did, and uh, we were in the British sec section, so Banksy was next to me here. Jamie Reed, who did all the graphics for the Sex Pistols, was on that side. Uh, and uh, Spike Jones was just on the other side of this, in a, like in a dark room. Uh, it was a massive show at the, that, and the neighborhood got quite destroyed as well, apparently. Um, this was in Moscow in 2012 for um, working with a, with, a, with a friend of mine there. And uh, like, uh, so uh, maybe when the political situation gets a bit easier, uh, it, there might be a chance to go back, but uh, I don't work for government stuff, but I do work for independence. Um, like uh, this was at um, 2017 or 2014 to, uh, in uh, Vienna, uh, improvised. Uh, again, it's taken from Déjeuner sur l'herbe, but this is Déjeuner sur le sable. And uh, so, um, uh, and that's the live stuff that you just do in front of, audience, whatever, uh, and that's the, the end thing, yeah? Uh, anyway, yeah, and that's uh, late at the Tate 2014 at Tate Britain. Uh, it was one of their biggest, busiest evenings, five minutes left. Anyway, like, uh, um, this was December 2015 for uh, Four Pillars, also live painting. Um, and uh, this was a um, couple of years ago, uh, no, uh, uh, 2010, no, maybe later, at um, Rosenhof uh, um, in, uh, for a company that does uh, upcycling uh, called Pentatonic, uh, but uh, they've moved out of there. Um, so anyway, Berlin, oh yeah, uh, Berlin Wall, 1993, that was the first time I was here. Uh, and then there's a mural in uh, Cottbus at all. I don't know if some of you know this one on Admiralstrasse, it's still there, still there. And this was uh, what we did with uh, the gentleman sitting over there. And uh, Poet 62, I don't know if you guys see the name Poet 62, but uh, this was uh, uh, like one of the, probably one of the oldest murals in Berlin uh, still. Um, and recently, uh, wow, well, I can slow down. I'm, I'm too, 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 don't worry. Thank you. No, no, you told me 45 minutes. I'm, I'm watching the clock here. It's like, a, it's like a five minutes of funk. Um, so anyway, um, so recently at Saatchi Gallery, uh, they, so for Beyond the Streets, they asked me, can you make a celebration of Covent Garden, blah, 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 but I don't like to be nostalgic. Uh, for me, what's interesting is uh, that we can um, tap into our position of opposition that we had to conformity to uh, uh, how society is to... Uh, um, we felt in 1984-85 uh, that we were a step ahead of how society was going and that uh, everything seemed like a wide open uh, horizon to explore. And, uh, but the problem is that um, these days, I mean, especially since the implementation of computers, we tend to delegate way too much of this to uh, digital tools to kind of do it for us, and we're not using our brains and our human senses and, and uh, stuff enough. But back then it was all about improvising and, uh, and, uh, and just trying to make stuff out of nothing. There's a very famous uh, quote, very famous, probably not, uh, from uh, Peter Tosh, uh, uh, where he says, uh, in the ghetto, we became creative with mathematics, we took zero and zero and made one. You know, and that's the kind of, uh, 
autonomous uh, thinking that people should try to uh, get because um, many people have not realized that since globalization, uh, colonial rule has come to Europe to its birthplace and is being uh, kind of pretty much uh, laid out over everybody. Anyway, so in the back of this thing, there's her, these are the names of the GLC, the Greater London Council, 1969 to 1986. Thatcher took that one out. Uh, but that was a really good uh, cultural uh, uh, place. The Tapit Hen, like the, these are names of, air, of uh, places that do not exist anymore. So I wanted to, because these were very key places, uh, uh, components to the melting pot, to the cross-pollination, to the, to the boiling of, uh, of uh, culture that we were living back then. Uh, everything is done from uh, photos of my own, except that which is the girl that I showed you in the photos earlier. She, uh, I had to call them, I reached out to them on Instagram, hadn't seen them in like decades. And I said, oh, do you have any photos of you back in the days? Because I remember when they were dancing, uh, Ziggy and Sahara, and uh, didn't have anything, so I had to imagine. And uh, so I put them back into context from back then. And uh, Sipo, uh, he was a 15 year old, like really, really nice guy um, who, um, uh, the head of the Zulu nation, the universal Zulu nation, Africa Bambata, who we found out later was a pedophile predator, um, tried to rape him and that messed up his, um, uh, him, I think, a lot. But anyway, uh, years later he ended up committing suicide, which is, I don't know whether they're related, but anyway, I'm not really into all that Zulu shit. We, weren't, we, we, we stopped that in 85. Um, but like, uh, he could do head spins and he'd, um, really skinny guy, uh, and he'd, uh, pump his legs like this and he'd go by really slow, really slow. It was incredible like how graceful it was. But anyway, like uh, this was a, there was always so many characters around who were really um, uh, inspiring, yeah? And everyone was inspiring everyone else. We were just bouncing off of each other and it, that creates a kind of synergy that's uh, very, eh, we can say rare. I, I meet it more on, on a dance floor than anywhere else when I get a chance to go out. Uh, Danny Francis, really good dancer. It took me ages to do this leather jacket, really ages, like uh, with a pastel. <laughs> and that's Pride uh, Errol from Northwest London. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's a photo montage in the background. And, uh, and, um, and it was, yeah, like, uh, it's not nostalgia, it's how we grab the tools and the, and the mindset and the weapons of back then to uh, overcome the obstacles that are put in our way today, whether it's like surveillance, whether uh, it's like a, a saturation with a completely pointless information that's going to distract us from what we are trying to do, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and that was upstairs. Uh, again, party things, and uh, I don't know, like uh, maybe some people are going to find this a bit controversial, but anyway, when the Bundestag were talking about having children forcibly uh, vaccinated, uh, while the parents were at work uh, without the parents' consent. Um, these are the kind of things that I like to uh, also talk about because if you get a platform, man, say something. You know, like, uh, and, uh, okay, that's the end of my, um, uh, shut up, shut up. Uh, and, um, and during lockdown, uh, the level of domestic violence really went up because dysfunctional couples who were already like, dysfunctional before then, uh, the partners couldn't get away, you know, so that's where the, curtains behind the, the become like prison bars and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, this is all that, what's it? Uh, there's so much uh, to be talked about and, 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 and uh, like, uh, so uh, whatever you do, uh, find what's close to you, keep your eyes and ears and whatever open and uh, put that into what you do. Uh, I, I never went to art school, didn't do any of that kind of stuff. I just grabbed what there is around me and put it into what I do. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you. Still breathing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I come next to you. Thank you so much. This was amazing. As you said in the beginning, it's going to be a roller coaster kind of ride through history uh, over the last 40 something years yeah. uh, of uh, politics, uh, culture, art, and everything in between. Um, I mean, again, uh, you warm up for your questions. I I'll okay, break okay, the okay, ice okay. with the first one. Let's, have, let's put something nice. Yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> that, that's good. That's very relaxing. I like that. 
Um, one of uh, the questions uh, that I always ask that I'm very curious about, and you kind of answered to all of that, um, is where people kind of draw their inspirations from, what inspires them. And I remember we met last Friday to kind of quickly run through the, the presentation. And you have to imagine we're sitting in midday in a cafe, and while we're talking about this and looking at images, you're like, oh, have you seen the dress of that lady, the pattern? And you got up, and I don't know, no, this he didn't take a picture. Then uh, two minutes later, he goes, oh, wait, there's a light on that building, the facade. You went, took a picture with the camera, analog, yeah. then came back to the conversation. So it seems like you're drawing inspirations from everywhere, but could you elaborate on, your, on the inspirational process of things, and in particular the one when collaborating also with others? Um, we, are, we are living sensorial animal beings, yeah, and, um, and uh, since, I mean, like, uh, if you look at some of the movies and stuff uh, from up until the 70s, or even a lot of, like, car design and furniture design and all this kind of stuff, um, like, for cars, uh, every uh, manufacturer had its uh, aerodynamics uh, laboratory where they had the wind tunnel, uh, where they had like, either bits of tape or they had smoke and everyone's going, my, my version of aerodynamics is going to be better than so and so and so and so. But when the computers start coming in and, and doing simulations and projections, um, because we delegate, we delegate, we delegate, and, uh, or when the calculators came into maths exams, I remember when that happened, uh, because before then it was all up here, um, we start to um, go on pilot mode. You know, we, ju we just uh, like, uh, but we should never forget that we are living sensorial beings and that uh, we, we are, there's just so much beauty around us, even in this shitty world, like, uh, because um, uh, some people would like to make it even shittier for us uh, for their own benefit, you know, but like, uh, I'm digressing. But like, uh, but um, yeah, like the African la lady in this, uh, you see people that just stand out from the rest because they just dress differently and she had this really nice kind of, uh, kind of purple, but it wasn't quite purple, it was a bit reddish, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and then she was walking like this, you know, sunny afternoon, and then there's that building, uh, the diptych, the diptych building on, um, uh, is it Wosenthalerstrasse? Mm, uh, so. it's, it's near uh, Café Mitte, Gegenüber, blah, 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 but like uh, the mouldings on the, on the top of the, on the facade that uh, many, um, could not afford to uh, get uh, the proper uh, Stukatir or whatever they call them, technicians and artisans to have them renovated. So many places in Berlin have had them removed. Where, you know, so anything that I see uh, that's uh, kind of like pre-war for me is super interesting. Uh, and uh, like where the Stetson shop is or the shop on the corner that was also peppered with bullet holes. And, uh, when it, and for me, it's really bizarre, like when they try to mask all that shit over, it's like, wait, we're forgetting stuff that uh, this, the past century has actually been through and uh, we are losing our reference points. And me, I'm always just like uh, aware or trying to stay awake or trying to keep like a childlike curiosity, you know, like children, oh, there's always this, oh, there's always that, you know. We need to keep that kind of aspect of ourselves like alive because uh, we can intellectualize as much as we want, you know, but like uh, I also like a lot of uh, gut feeling uh, mm -hmm. and just uh, improvising uh, and, and that's how I tend to, to be. There's just too much stimulus around us that's really worth getting into and uh, when you're having a shitty day, I'm sure there's some bits of uh, uh, beauty somewhere that can uh, perk us up a bit. Mm, that answer that. Okay, now for you, Hassan. Um, and loud and clear to the last uh, uh, how broken I can, like, get this off right, but like, um, you talked a lot about like, perspective and stuff. And also with like, references, like right now, like, you kind of forget it nowadays. Um, so kind of from coming from Mauritius to like, Europe or like UK, um, and then kind of being freaky into like, science fiction or whatever, and then having this output of like, uh, graffiti and like, art on the street, which is kind of a public space again, uh, for example, it's like Covent Garden, for example, which is kind of nowadays this hyper touristic spot where you can't see anything of that anymore. So um, I just wanted to ask, like, there's this dialogue again, like, you know, Virgil kind of kind this kind of the tourist and the poorest always being in dialogue, uh, you know. So someone who's like really freaky into his art, displaying it on like public space where people then see it and uh, perceive it in another completely another way. Um, with especially places like Covent Garden, so I just wanted to know kind of how you see those happenings with the, with the example of like Covent Garden 
how graffiti and like your art and influence in the space, but like 20 years later looks completely different. Um, also, it's like the Paris example that you did, like it downstairs of Museo de Jose. So, how would you kind of describe your perspective when it reflects like tourist purist example and how the impact of graffiti can be kind of expressed in that sort of way, you know? Does it make it any sense? Or? Like a tourist and purist. I mean, like a, uh, when I was in a, in a Cape Town uh, on the market that like one morning, like I see this uh, tourist and he's walking around and he's just filming. So, he's not actually living the space around him, uh, he's, he's focused on filming, a bit like loads of people go to concerts and hold uh, camera phones up, as if they're the, really the best cameraman with, or camera woman with these, with these pieces of technology, instead of enjoying the damn thing, yeah? Like, and actually absorbing the thing. And uh, we are being um, kind of taken down this kind of a weird road to, uh, like again, it, to um, a kind of, um, uh, sleepiness, you know, and uh, and um, and um, and uh, lethargy, like, a, uh, and I'm not, r I, like I said, the control systems are being now uh, implemented in uh, Europe, you know, like uh, we're having polarization of society, of people uh, made to fight one another, you know, it's like uh, the they say, you know, like globalization uh, uh, sold us uh, this idea that the world is going to come together and we're going to be. No, globalization meant that it was easier to outsource industries from here to places of cheaper labor, easier to bring cheaper labor to here, and easier to go and hide uh, your profits from, uh, tax, from the tax authorities. You know, and, uh, but people are still like, uh, not really paying attention in the kind of a tourist kind of way because they're just buying the, the, the what's that, the accepted or the uh, narrative or the official narrative. But like in Covent Garden in like 1984, we thought, oh man, all these people are super sleepy. Da, da, da. You can't use that word sleep these days because then they're going to find it, oh, is, is that woke? You know, it's another stupid word getting banded around. But like uh, we felt that we were so way ahead of everything when, um, uh, we had a, um, um, what, what, what do you call it, um, shops, people would steal from shops, people would improvise everything around them. Uh, we are not asking permission for public space, public space is being taken. Uh, I think the uh, cities have been so dehumanised uh, because uh, they are just places for consumption, to get from a, a home to work, you consume, you come back, it's like, a, uh, you know, like you have signs saying a, a cross, stop, uh, or signs and, and adverts saying, uh, vote for so-and-so, buy this, be that, oh, uh, you look like this, you look like that, you should change your life, you know, but all of it is just to do with uh, spending the hard-earned money while the value of your wages have stayed stuck in the 1980s. Uh, con uh, what's that? Uh, and uh, we've been put on credit since then, and we've been made, uh, what's that, uh, inducted laborers. We've sold off weeks, months, and uh, years of our labor already because we're all in debt. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, so we've all become kind of te technically slaves. And like, so, you know, like, how, you know, are we just gonna go around like this? You know, or are we gonna try to somehow find a, a way out and, and, and gain some little bit of ground for just ourselves, for just our own enjoyment, which doesn't mean uh, that being at the detriment of someone else. I don't have to uh, uh, take, you know, from somebody else to make myself happy, put it that way. Great. Another question here. I don't know if that answered. Um, yeah, earlier in your talk you mentioned the movie, um, not Star Wars, it was the other one. Wild, Wild Star. Wild Star, exactly, Wild Star. And I think there was this moment in the early 80s when like, this movie got released and Star Wars as well and like, a couple of other things where there was a public interest of like um, galleries and stuff which then showcased graffiti in New York and all that. And I was wondering if you noticed anything of that in London during that time as well or if it always was this art form which was pushed in the underground and not really like any public like, um, interest appeared after that. Because I think it was just a short period of time and then after that they just like kind of graffiti again and was just pushed back to the underground again. The, the, when you actually talk to uh, Charlie Ahern and, uh, or to Henry Schaufon about um, how these things, they actually did decided to do th these uh, documentaries and films at a particular time just because, like a bit like me taking photos, you know, uh, watching this advert of Patrick Litchfield taking photos with a Canon short shot. Uh, families up, up until then, 
they took the camera out for birthdays, Christmas, Easter, and all that kind of, but we didn't record what was actually happening around us in our every day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Wild Style uh, used real life people to kind of tell a kind of this like love story between Lee and Lady Pink, uh, but you know, but it was just to depict the New York uh, uh, equation, the, the scene of a, of a, of a then. And, a Star, and Star Wars was also like a documentary that tried to look at the dancing, the music, and the painting that was happening on the trains. Uh, it's also happening at a time when there was a, apparently the, the contract for the surveillance of the yards was out for a month and a bit, and so there were lots of trains being painted at a particular time in, a, in, a, in a New York then. You know, but it's just, it's, uh, there's so much coincidence and so much just a collision of, a, of a different um, uh, influences and different factors, and, and that's what was creating, making these sparks fly. It's like the French people who were, uh, Bernard Zécri and uh, Alain Manval who were in uh, New York, uh, Sabine Cassel, the, the mother of Vincent Cassel and, uh, and uh, Mathias, you know, like a bando going back and forth. So there was this kind of weird kind of cross-pollination going on there. Then uh, Futura got to tour with The Clash, you know, like, uh, and uh, so it's like um, just people uh, traveling and saying, wow, this is great, you know, like, uh, but like really at a time when there was not, it's not a saturated light to today. I mean, like, again, coming back to the uh, documenting, we've gone, all the way the other way because um, when we do this with digital, we're not paying. Yeah, it's not like a 17 euro roll of film, uh, which which is what it costs now. You know, from a uh, whether it's Jet Photo or the other one on uh, on Rosenthal uh, like a, like a, um, and uh, and um, so uh, when I had film in the camera, I really had to think. Uh, whether this is worth taking or not, you know, so you were really picking the moments and uh, and uh, and uh, thinking about it because it wasn't cheap, yeah, like uh, and uh, so, but you were actually also living the moment like uh, like uh, at the, the, the same time, and uh, so people use what uh, technology they had back then, which was rudimentary, and just improvised this documentary. And like I said, it's ZDF who were who were actually. Uh, co-funded uh, Wildstar, otherwise I don't know if it would have happened. But it was, uh, there was a screening at the, at the Kunst, whatever, what's that place on, uh, on uh, Gibbs, on um, Auguststrasse, the, the place where the Martin Wong show is. Kavi. Yeah, 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 there was, a, there, was yeah. A, there was a screening and a talk with Neon and Days like a few weeks ago, 14th of April, anyway. Uh, yes, a question? You were about to go down a rabbit hole about privatisation of London and Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. Could you go it's down not a rabbit hole. hole. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, she said in 1980 there is no alternative. Yeah? And every economist, politician, all these people, they, it was as if she cast a spell and they just limited their own thinking. Oh, we will not imagine a world outside of these boundaries, yeah? And it's like, man, that's bullshit. You know, it's like, um, um, uh, and if we've been living like a, 40 odd years of that kind of crap, you know, and then like um, she said uh, at a conference, at a speech in 2005, that her greatest achievement was new labor, yeah? And uh, so you think uh, when Tony Blair's coming in in 1997 and you, and you can hear things are gonna get better, no, it's not because uh, Rupert Murdoch, who Margaret Thatcher uh, changed the law so that he could buy uh, the Times. Rupert Murdoch owned the Sun, you know, toilet rag of a paper, yeah? Like, uh, and, um, and uh, she changed the law so that he could buy the Times as well. So he had the tabloid, but he also had the broadsheet. So he now, he had the politicians cornered in a kind of a pincer movement of, uh, oh, if you fuck up this way, then I get the proletariat against you. If you fuck up that way, then, I, then we hate you from, from that side. Rupert Murdoch became kingmaker in British politics from that point on. Um, I think that Alexander Haig, uh, Secretary of State back, back then, he warned Margaret Thatcher about General Gautieri building up a, an invasion fleet in uh, Punta Arenas, was it? Uh, uh, where for, for the Falklands, and Thatcher was like, ah, I didn't see that, I didn't hear that, because she was super low in the ratings, we had riots all over the place, super high unemployment, strikes all over the place, and uh, there's nothing better than a war to get the patriotism 
going again. So a lot of people, so there are, there's loads of stuff there. She privatised water. She was the first one to privatise water. So if you look in, in, into the billions that uh, uh, privatised water firms are making in the UK now and how much sewage they're pumping out into the sea and into the rivers, like it's insane. Fergal Sharkey, the singer from The Undertones, uh, is really good on that kind of stuff. But The Undertones is a bit too old for most of you. But anyway, that was... Uh, but, but also, like, how did the privatisation affect London for you and your experience of it? Like how did the and a short change? answer to this very complex question to get the space for uh, more a, general ones. Yeah. It's, uh, the thing is that the, um, when the, cost of, when the uh, average cost of everything is based on the earners in the city, everything goes up. Yeah? Uh, so there's no political uh, regulation to kind of a rent cap and all that kind of stuff. But a city where teachers nurses, uh, policemen, all these kind of uh, parts of the infrastructure of a city cannot afford to live, you don't have a city anymore. And London is completely artificial, like in that, like in that way. It's completely out of proportion, the, the amount of empty property owned by people. Just um, When they lost the empire, uh, they, uh, they boosted like the Virgin Islands, like, all these are uh, tax havens, and, all, and, uh, and, the, and the city of London, they're called the city of London, is, a, is the biggest lawn, uh, money laundering uh, 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 place in the world, you know, like, uh, so anyway. And uh, uh, another question here. Maybe I go for two, three more questions. One, I don't two, care, just three, bring them on. Three. Yeah. So thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. Um, I got a somewhat technical or could be also philosoph philosophical question. Uh, so when creating an artwork, how important is the distance for you um, to take from the artwork? Because you were talking about being blindfolded or being very much in the moment. So how many times do you actually like step back to get proportions right, or are you literally in front of the wall, walking along the wall? So how does that come to play? And have you ever sprayed over security cameras out of anger for a public space that like is small? Um, <laughs> well, sir, like uh, I think the best answer to stepping back and looking is actually on a double page of spray can art. There's an aerosol art piece I did with Bando and, and Pride between the 23rd and the 24th of June of 85. <laughs> and um, yeah, because I, I remember when I'd take the train to go there. Anyway, like, uh, and, um, and the girl's face in the middle, her eyes are too close together. And every time I look at it, I go, oh, no, no, no. But yeah, because back then you were so happy painting <laughs> that you don't step back and you look at your stuff. You know, like you don't take the time to actually step back because you're just into it. You're just into it, you know. And, uh, but that's, you know, uh, I guess the fire of youth and stuff. And uh, um, maybe sometime we should, we should kind of step back and uh, take a look. But, you know, like the guys, uh, we, you were just too, too excited, you know. You, you just, uh, uh, we're just here, we're painting, we're painting. And uh, you only notice that afterwards, you know, like, uh, because, um, I mean, like, uh, I, 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 I never did any art school. I never did any, uh, um, um, uh, what's that, classes or anything like that, like, or further stuff, you know, I, I just try to improvise with what I know and uh, some odd sittings every now and then, but like, uh, but with regards to painting, like, uh, or when you're painting from one angle and then like you see that your, that your visual is a bit kind of slanted, you know, there's all this kind of stuff as well. It happens all the time, but um, like dancers or like musicians, on this concert or on this dance floor, you know, that day or that night, that's how it was played, or in the theater, like as well. That's how they interpreted it that night. That's how it went down, you know, don't worry about it. You know, it's, it's no, you know, uh, you'll, you'll do it differently the next time. Uh, what's it, painting over security cameras, that's not really uh, uh, my thing. Can I, can I have a security camera, uh, little, what's it? Yeah. It's yeah. Banksy with security cameras, yeah? Um, when the Good Friday Agreement comes in in Northern Ireland, uh, so we're talking 1997. All these are uh, because Northern Ireland was a laboratory for urban surveillance and the British surveillance industry, that's where everything was tested live on a, in a European country on some poor people who are kept fighting each other, yeah? Like so-called loyalists and Republicans or Catholics and Protestants and so on and so forth. And uh, like, uh, and that, when the Good Friday ag Agreement comes in and the conflicts or troubles come to an end, all these people are under contract with the, with the government, all the surveyors, they go, yeah, so what's in it for us then? You know, like, uh, 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 so that's when 
all this CCTV then suddenly starts to spread on mainland Britain. Before then, there wasn't. But these are the same people who now have contracts in civil, and the CCTV just starts to spread everywhere, the same way that uh, the US police get uh, military hardware from Gulf Wars and stuff like that that have been repainted for uh, uh, urban policing, apparently. You know? So the militarization of police or the, or the spreading of, uh, of uh, security stuff is all just uh, coming from the same kind of military angle, as it were, and uh, they need to control. Leon. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask if, well, like, what was the reason for you to come to Berlin? If there was already a big graffiti movement here, or if you were part of somewhat like the pioneers that started out right here. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah, and also if Berlin was special in any way at that time. Um, I think Berlin, Paris, and London are very similar in a, a subway architecture, you know, with a with a overground and underground. Uh, but also, in in a historical sense, this triangle of uh, London, Paris, Berlin, you know, with regards to kind of uh, uh, warring cultures that have kind of uh, uh, been at each other uh, culturally for centuries, you know, like uh, there's there's that aspect of it. I first ended up uh, on Helmholtzplatz uh, somewhere towards the end of March 1993 because uh, there was a, a thing called the Clean Jam in Hanover uh, a few days before. We painted there, then we went from there to a jam in Potsdam. So, so it was, um, I think it was a Friday Clean Jam Hanover, Saturday Potsdam, Sunday Hem, um, uh, Helmholtzplatz. And I've, and, uh, Coming from a kind of a immigration background, like I have a problem with uh, cities that are not, it's not a problem, but when it's not very cosmopolitan, you can kind of feel it, yeah? So Hamburg's nice because that's a harbor city, and it also has a very kind of a, um, it's very open to the world. But because um, Germany had its uh, colonies taken away from it, like after two world wars, there's a kind of a bizarre, less familiarity with people from exotic backgrounds and stuff like this. It's not like what the British have with the, with the West Indian or the uh, Indian subcontinent or Chinese background um, uh, ex-colonies and colonies. And it's not like with the French, with the North Africa, with all of West Africa that they're still holding under control, but that's another thing. And, uh, or um, Indochina with Vietnam, Cambodia and all this kind of stuff. You know, so, um, so you kind of have to look a bit in Germany to find where it's kind of a nice and mixed up, you know. And uh, but like I, but because uh, of some of the cross pollination that was happening between some writers from Paris that uh, Adrian was a uh, was a uh, uh, handling back then, you know, like Berlin was going to be somewhere where I was going to end up anyway. And uh, Ultimately, it's because it's cheaper than everywhere else. Because uh, in London, you uh, are sharing a studio and you're running around trying to get the money together to pay for the rent of the studio. You're not in it yet. You're not, uh, you know. And so it's really, it really is uh, ridiculously expensive. And a lot of my uh, UK friends are now uh, thinking of where they're going to move to: Spain, Portugal, you know, because they can't afford it. You know. Mm. One final question. Um, what do you want to leave behind in the world of your art, or like, what do you uh, want your influence to be? Um, it's a very nice uh, closing question, by the way. I think that anyone and everyone can just actually do something with their lives, and uh, and uh, that. Um, um, Okay, yeah, so I was born with a skill uh, with uh, to um, do stuff with my hands, but. Um, I heard you were talking about the, the previous um, um, talks that you had. Um, for example, when it comes to uh, clients and all this kind of stuff, if I don't use a product in my own life, I will not uh, do a job for something that I don't use myself. So we need to have a bit of integrity. We need to uh, also ask who's paying, because uh, it's the same with technology, you know, like, uh, um, we equate mistakenly technology with progress, but we do not ask ourselves who are financing the research and design uh, for these technologies and to what ultimate ends. 
And when there's uh, economic factors behind, it's always about control, always. Yeah? And, uh, and, and there's this kind of to and fro between the commercial and the oppressive, you know, uh, government, military, whatever you want. And uh, I think we have to be able to maintain our autonomy, uh, to uh, be able to step back and look at the world with our own eyes, not to get to let ourselves be um, coached into looking at things in a, in, a, in a certain way. That would be already like a good start. And also, um, the idea of people waiting for a leader to come in, like, that's bullshit. Lead yourself, you know, don't wait uh, and don't hang on to someone to show you the way. Listen to where any information is coming from and try to be as objective about what you choose to, uh, to uh, take on or not. But uh, do not put any hopes on anyone to do it for you because uh, any positive change in this world is going to take a mass collective effort and not uh, individual leaders to kind of lead something. Um, in the 1960s and 70s, they all just got killed. Because, uh, because, and that's how you decapitate any cultural movement, or that's how you uh, take uh, Jeremy Corbyn out of the equation in the UK, for instance. You know, that's how uh, Fred Hampton got murdered, uh, Martin Luther King got killed, Malcolm X got killed. That's how uh, Laurent Gbagbo from Ivory Coast spent nine years at The Hague for supposed like uh, political this, that, and the other. They found him like, not guilty, it was just to take him out of the equation uh, because um, the French still have a massive hold on most of West Africa, and uh, which is what creates a lot of the immigration, uh, economic like, migration issues that we are suffering from. You know, so uh, uh, it's just like a try to just um, develop your own uh, vision that works for that works for you. But uh, at the same time, I don't know, like try to be objective and try, uh, what's it? You don't need to profit from somebody else uh, to make something for yourself, you know? So, uh, so uh, yeah. and uh, the more autonomous you are, the more when we come together and share and do things, the more we can bring to the central pool, you know? So it's, it's these kind of notions that I'd like to uh, put forward. So, uh, wise words. Now, like I did last time, quick recap, what stayed with you? What, what kind of, what, what are the takeaways of tonight? Spontaneous, quick. Lead yourself. Lead yourself. Dance. What? Dance. 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 Not enough of it. Be a nerd about stuff. Be a nerd about stuff. Actually, I thought about two. You're such a wonderful nerd. And I love it. I think that's probably saying here that's a common denominator. Be, be, be passionate about it. Be about passionate about it. Yeah, about, this is know. a great festival of nerds. Yeah. This Leidenschaft? Is that a Leidenschaft? Yeah, Leidenschaft. Yeah. Yeah. Nerds. Childish curiosity. Childish curiosity. Be more objective about the world. Be more objective, objective about the world. This corner. Integrity. Nice one. There's always something beautiful in this shit. There's always something beautiful in this shitty place. In the back. Uh, work hard for your dreams. Work hard. <laughs> you did that last week as well. Work hard for your dreams. It's a good one. <laughs> Take away in this corner. Autonomous. What? Autonomous. Autonomous thinking. Autonomous thinking. And now, usually because your question kind of took away my last question, is always I ask uh, the speaker's final piece of advice uh, for, for the students here, which you just gave. But I'll turn it around. Another second favorite question of mine. What has been the best advice ever given to you, and by whom? I don't know, could it be from my mum just to... It's often your moms. What was it like a, when my... When you migrate from somewhere, and uh, this is a thing with many cultures, it's like uh, you have to realise, you have to look on your own culture and try to identify what are its good and bad sides. There's good and bad in, in everywhere, yeah? So when you're migrating and you've got all that luggage, you've got to work out, you know what? I don't need this, I don't need that, I don't need that. And a lot of people, they just take too much uh, rubbish with them. You know, you're like a hot air balloon that's losing altitude and you've got to throw off the sandbags, yeah? Mm. And, uh, and, and, and to gain altitude again. And, move, and moving some, somewhere else is a clean slate, a chance to start again. But it doesn't mean that you lose your roots, yeah? And uh, so, uh, and my mother, like, uh, she, she, she knew that if she stayed in Mauritius, she'll only be uh, my father's wife. She might not learn to drive a car. Uh, you know, there's loads of stuff that she wouldn't be able to do because you're born in that 
uh, kind of prism, yeah, and a, a prison, prism, whatever. Like her, and uh, and uh, so um, and she encouraged me because she watched all the other Mauritian families. Like uh, we'd meet every New Year because my father's oldest brother was a school caretaker, is a housemaster of a of a primary school. And so we'd have the Mauritian get-togethers, and you have the parents comparing the children like cattle or, or, or horses, you know, like, oh, so what's your son doing? Oh, what's your daughter doing? You know, and uh, they're blocked in their head on, um, on a, a model of a society that is, uh, no, this is imposed from above, yeah? And, uh, and uh, you, need, you need to try and find what works for you. If I can go further on that, um, What's that? I have an aunt who collects uh, too much stuff, yeah? And uh, the same way that I used to collect too many magazines. I've stopped with that, yeah, I got that under control. Uh, but like, um, there are people who collect newspapers and newspapers and newspapers and that they'll never read. There are people who go and rescue animals on the street and bring them into their, I'm gonna save it, I'm gonna save it. But no, they've got so many suffering animals that are dying in their house, but when they, the point was to try and save them, yeah? We look at this, and we recognize it as a pathology of hoarding. Yeah? The, the, these people have a pathology there. But when someone does that with money, we find them on the cover of Forbes magazine, Time, of Fortune, of all these, like, because uh, these people also suffer from a pathology of hoarding and they're doing it with money, but their money is buying the media to turn their sickness into a success story. You, and that's what we're being sold. And we're prepared to kill one another to get that kind of status, you know. So that's why even when Louis Farrakhan is talking about, oh, and the, and the first billionaire black couple, he's talking about Jay-Z, ex-drug dealer, and like Beyonce, like, ah, come on. You know, like, I don't give a shit. You know, he's got all the rings and stuff. You know, it's like, a, we do not have to become the poster boys and poster girls of a system that is destroying this planet. We need to try to define, uh, what's that, conceive, define, and implement alternatives unlike what Margaret Thatcher said in 1980. But, but this is a kind of a, of a mom, like my mom told me, yeah, just do your stuff, you know, like so, and like, so, so really try and find what works, but be aware of much of what you're being shown as success stories, or, oh, this is the way it is, is just imposed from above, and um, it's our brains that have been colonized the same way that countries and territories used to be colonized and children from the people of there used to be put into boarding schools to beat the Indian out of them, beat the, abor the Aborigine out, out, out of them, and beat their culture and identity out of them. Maintain your identity, maintain your autonomy, thank you, and uh, like, uh, uh, try to see objectively what works for you. Wow, powerful. So conceive and implement our brand new. If you don't, if you don't stop me, like this is going to go on, and I, and I've got to go and feed the children. Yeah. But like, yeah. But thank you so much. Uh, this was amazing. I have a bit of a goosebumps moment here right now. Bish bash bosh, as you said, this was wonderful. I see you all next week, and another warm applause.